Hey everyone, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, poisons and venoms and the first aid necessary to deal with them in a wilderness situation. Obviously, you're going to be exposed to potentially a lot of different poisons and venoms. Um, venom is something that is injected uh, into you by an animal, uh, most particularly, and uh, poison is something that you would ingest typically or that you would be exposed to through your skin. Um, and both of these can have significant reactions, even life-threatening reactions. So we need to learn how to deal with this uh, using first aid. Uh, this is actually a um, image of a painting from like 1780, uh, which is I think King Edward. Uh, but the interesting thing is his wife came with him on his crusades in the Middle East. And at some point he was attacked with a poison dagger and his wife, so the story goes, sucked the blood out of him and saved his life. Um, and the reason I've got it there is one, that's a weird ass piece of history. So that's kind of cool. But two, to remind you, don't do this. I know you've seen it in movies and TV shows, but you should be never, ever, ever sucking the blood out of, or I'm sorry, the uh, venom out of anything. So if there's a snake bite, um, if there's any kind of exposure, be whatever, whatever, you should not be sucking out poison. And the reason for that should be pretty obvious. You don't want poison in your mouth. So if somebody is bit by a snake and there's now venom in that person's leg, let's say, and you suck the blood out, now we have two snake bite victims. You, who has venom ingested in his mouth, just as deadly, and the other person who still has venom in the leg, because there's no way you're sucking the venom out of the leg. So definitely don't be any suck doing any sucking uh, in terms of first aid. Uh, the first thing we want to deal with is what would be called allergic contact dermatitis. Derma means skin. And when we end a word in titus in medicine, that means inflammation. So allergic contact dermatitis just means that your immune system is overreacted uh, when it's contacted with a um, foreign substance. And that caused your skin to get inflamed or otherwise uh, irritated. Uh, this is um, a picture I took a few years ago of me with a uh, poison ivy. And you can see it creates this kind of corpuscle uh, kinds of um, scarring to it. Uh, the key with poison ivy to realize is that it's an oil. It is really only going to create a reaction if you touch the plant or the oil itself. So usually that means just touching the plant, but it could be that if somebody else has recently touched the plant and they have the oil on their hands and then you touch them, you might get it uh, through secondary contact through them. What's more probable and possible is if you get it in your hands and you say um, pee in the woods, you might now have some poison ivy in very private places. And I can tell you from experience that that is an unpleasant situation. So you wanna be really careful uh, when you're around poison ivy. If you do get exposed to it, don't freak out. You've got about an hour to two hours before you're actually likely to get a reaction. The reaction to be clear will come much later, but you have an hour or two hours before the exposure is adequate to create a reaction. So. If you're out uh, somewhere near Stockton campus, let's say pretty nearby, and you accidentally brush up against some poison ivy, so now you've got poison ivy oils on your arm. If you start wiping that off, that's just gonna smear it around. That's a bad idea. But you've got about an hour at least to get to some place where you can take some cool water and plenty of it and soap and plenty of that Ideal would be something like dishwashing detergent that is designed to cut oils and therefore wash it all off. So cool water and um, some dishwashing um, soap uh, and really scrub the area and wash it all off. If you think you got it on more than one body part, it may be a good time to just hop in the shower and completely douse yourself uh, and bring in the Dawn dishwashing soap and wash yourself down uh, to get rid of all the oils. If you get rid of all the oils within an hour or so, you really should not be having a significant reaction at all. Realize that the corpuscles themselves are going to have fluid in them. So you, if you've had this, you know they dry out, you scratch them, and kind of an oily fluid comes out. That is not the same oil. That is not going to create a reaction. You don't need to worry about touching that. You don't need to worry about smearing that. Well, at least not in terms of uh, getting an allergic reaction from it. This is what poison ivy and poison oak look like. They're pretty common throughout North America. On the right is poison ivy. Uh, and that is common around here. You'll notice it's uh, three leaves. The leaves have little um, 
uh, segmented lobes on them, or serrated, excuse me, lobes. The serrations tend to be more prominent on the outside leaves. Uh, they could be red. They could be kind of smaller. Uh, they often glisten. They're a really pretty plant when they're young. They tend to have red stems and they tend to be really shiny. So it's be a beautiful house plant, if not for the fact that it would really mess you up. Uh, the poison oak, as you can see there in the middle, uh, is more common in the West. Uh, it's a cousin of poison ivy. It really has the same kind of effect. Uh, but you see, it looks a little more like an oak leaf, I guess. That's where it gets its name, poison oak. And then on the far left, you can see another reaction from it there. You can pretty clearly see the corpuscles. If you scratch those, uh, they would definitely um, cause fluid to leak out. But again, that fluid is not going to create a reaction. You're not going to get poison ivy from somebody else unless they just recently touched the plants. Uh, but realize, for example, if you're out walking your dog and your dog runs through some poison ivy and then you don't wash your dog and you're petting your dog, there's oil on your dog that could get on you. So it's possible that you could get a poison ivy reaction without ever actually touching the plant itself. Stinging nettle is out there as well. Don't worry too much about stinging nettle. If you haven't run across it before, it's not a life-changing experience, but it is kind of interesting. Uh, certainly around like the Poconos um, and uh, the Catskills, there's a lot of stinging nettles, like sometimes a whole region of them. I've had to walk through them before to get from one place to another. It's irritating. Basically, if you haven't uh, touched them before, when you touch them, it creates a sort of prickly, painful, kind of an effect as though you're getting like poked by tons of tiny little needles. It's not fun, but it's not life threatening. Uh, and by the time you count to 60, the major pain will be gone. Uh, it really doesn't last all that long. There's really no first aid required for that. But if it's really bothering somebody or they have a significant reaction, you can apply the first, for the same first aid you'd apply for poison ivy or oak with a particular focus on keeping air off of it and keeping it cool. So if you do have a poison nettle or poison oak reaction, one of the basic things you can do is just keep it cool uh, and keep it covered. And just keeping the air off of it is really going to reduce the itching a lot. But let's get into some of the more details of that. First off, it's important to notice that the itching sensation in the human body is transmitted through the pain receptors. Basically, throughout your body, you've got three types of receptors, hot receptors, cold receptors, and pain receptors. It's helpful that the pain receptors are the ones that transmit the itching sensation, because what it means is you can take regular medication that you take for pain and it will reduce the itching. So some ibuprofen, um, Advil, for example, Tylenol, acetaminophen, um, even aspirin will reduce the, um, the itching. So that's already a great thing to know. If you cool the area, applying a cool compress, something like that, that'll be very helpful. There are people out there that believe you should warm the area. That's never a good idea. And it's gonna intensify uh, the itching and the inflammation because you're drawing fluid and blood to the area. So you don't wanna do that. Maybe don't go to crazy with like an ice pack, but maybe something cool or indirect ice, like ice wrapped in a towel or your arm wrapped in a towel with a little ice on it uh, could really, um, cool the area down and help a lot. If you're in a wilderness scenario, go and sit in a pond or a creek for a little while. That will reduce the itching quite a bit. And basically, if you keep the air off of it, that will reduce the itching. So you can use uh, regular kinds of creams and ointments. Something like, for example, triple antibiotic ointment like that. Ooh, let's see if I can get that in focus. I can not. Maybe I can if I get out of the camera. Now I'm just playing. Um, nope. Okay, so I will hold it here. Will it be fo in focus? No, it's not working. There we go. Hydrocord, oh, I'm sorry, um, triple antibiotic. Basically, it's just a triple antibiotic ointment. And uh, you don't really need to put an antibiotic on um, poison ivy or poison oak rashes. They're unlikely to get too infected, but it couldn't hurt to have a little on there. More importantly, by covering in an ointment or a cream like that, um, you will reduce the sensation of um, itching quite a bit. Another way to cool it, by the way, is to put on something that will evaporate rapidly. I wouldn't do this at home because you have better options that don't sting, but if you sprayed a little alcohol or poured a little alcohol on the itchy area, you remember in your basic physics, when something evaporates, when it changes state from liquid to gas, it absorbs heat energy from its surroundings. That cools the surroundings. So if you spray some alcohol, um, on an itchy area, that alcohol will quickly evaporate. As you know, 
alcohol evaporates very quickly. And as it does that, it'll absorb heat from your skin. And that cooling effect will actually reduce the itching as well. So if you really got a lot of, um, you know, um, poison ivy uh, all over you, you're, you're, you're itching all over the place, maybe take a little spray bottle like you used to carry during COVID uh, with just alcohol or maybe more likely like a 60% solution of alcohol and water and just mist yourself down in those spots. Uh, and that'll cool that area and reduce the itching quite a bit. You can also put cellophane. I know it sounds crazy, but anything that'll keep the air off of it uh, is going to reduce the itching and burning quite a bit. Another possibility that I don't do, but some people do when they find relief, is um, if you've got weeping blisters in particular, so if there's fluid coming out of them, is you can dry it out by soaking it. So take a cloth and soak it in about a 5 to 10% solution of salt water. Uh, and that will actually sort of draw um, the salt into the skin and dry out your skin and cause that those weeping lesions uh, to dry out quite a bit. And as they dry out, you'll find that it's less irritating to you. There are medications you can use as well. One is Benadryl, uh, and Benadryl comes in a bottle like that. Wow. I got to change the focus on this thing. Well, you can see, there we go. It comes in a bottle like that, and you can spray it on. That's topical Benadryl. You could also do oral Benadryl. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend oral Benadryl unless you're in a significant situation where you've really got a serious reaction that's problematic because there are some side effects to Benadryl that uh, aren't really necessary to, to experience when you've got topical that work really well. Um, so topical Benadryl works pretty quickly. A hydrocortisone solution or a hydrocortisone cream like this um, could also work. Now, hydrocortisone um, is a steroidal. So the problem with this is you want to make sure that you've got the right kind of injury. And the other thing you remember in the uh, video when I talk about wounds, I think, and bleeding, I pointed out that you can cause damage with hydrocortisone. And I pointed that out, making the comment that you really want to always be careful about what you're doing and check back and make sure it's working. Because if you're doing something wrong, you want to recognize it really quickly. Uh, and in this case, you could do something wrong with hydrocortisone. First, if you put it on too much, you're going to cause tissue damage. So absolutely no more than four times a day. Four times a day, however, on an area where maybe you're recovering from some damage due to um, poison ivy or poison oak could actually accelerate the healing quite a bit and therefore get you to a spot uh, where you have less itching much more quickly. Here's the real big challenge. If you've mistaken a fungus for a reaction, then what you're going to have is a fungus on steroids, literally. So you can get skin fungi, and especially in a wilderness scenario, you're going to get skin fungi because A, there's a lot more fungus out there to be exposed to, but two, and this is much more important, you're likely to have parts of your body stay more moist and more dirty than they otherwise would when you're in a wilderness scenario, and that is going to promote fungal growth. And fungal growth isn't just between your toes as athlete's foot or maybe in your groin area where you might have heard of people getting fungus before. You can have fungus on your chest, on your back, on your legs, in all kinds of places. So if you get a rash, don't just naturally assume that it's poison ivy or poison oak. It could very well be a fungus that's growing. Uh, and if that's the case, you want to be careful and not apply a hydrocortisone solution or that fungus is going to be very happy and you're going to be very sad. Instead, what you want to do is provide a topical like antifungal um, kind of treatment. And you can do that with something like Desinex, which is a uh, myconazole. Uh, that's really good for athlete's foot or any place where you've got moisture and fungus. You could also apply a cream that is better um, for an area that's dry and fungus between your toes or something like that, and it'll work. But the problem, the, the idea is where you got moisture and fungus, you want something that's going to dry it out because the moistness is also allowing the fungus to grow. So myconazole typically comes in a powder solution, so it's going to absorb moisture and dry the area out. So you're kind of getting dual advantage. If you didn't happen to bring something like that, and you're out on a 20 day hiking trip and you're two days out and suddenly your feet are breaking out on a fungus. And you can see there in the pictures below what foot fungus looks like and actually get really severe. And the problem is obviously it's painful. 
Um, but in addition to that, you're going to get cracking that's going to leave the possibility of you getting other infections. In fact, you get a serious infection that leads to sepsis as a result of athlete's foot. So you shouldn't simply just ignore the athlete's foot because it allows other contaminants, other potential forms of an infection to enter your body. Uh, so you want to treat it right away. Getting back to my point, if you're out backpacking on a 20 day trip and three days out, you got athlete's foot, you absolutely shouldn't ignore it. But what you can do is try to dry it out. Any kind of starchy material, especially, um, let's say rock climbing chalk would work out really well. Uh, corn starch would work out really well. Um, anything like that uh, will allow the skin, to, the area to dry out, and especially if you can expose it to the sun. So spend, you know, a couple hours a day relaxing and enjoying the sun on a high rock um, and put some cornstarch between your toes, and that'll help take care of uh, any fungus growing there. And again, the toes are just a common place for this because it's uh, warm there, but you can certainly get fungus on your back, on your neck, and other places as well. Exposure to sunlight, um, that drying effect and the, U, the effect of UV radiation is going to be really helpful there. And again, be careful because you do not want to put hydrocortisone on a fungal infection. Down below, there are different kinds of fungal infections. And you can see, they, it's really not easy to see uh, what a fungus is going to look like. So I can't just say this is what fungus always looks like because depending on the fungus, it could look like just a general area of dryness. It could look like a red rashy area. It could look moist. It could look dry, et cetera. Uh, so in your first aid kit, if you're not going to bring a fungicide, and it's a good idea to bring a fungicide, but if you're not going to bring a fungicide, then at least bring something like cornstarch or something you could use to dry an area. Before I change slides, one last point. We used to have talc, which is a mineral that could dry an area out. Now you're not going to find any talc. Everything is using cornstarch. The disadvantage of that is that cornstarch can also cre create a biological medium for the growth of fungus. So <laughs> if you got fungus on your feet, you don't want to put cornstarch between your toes, put on your socks, put on your shoes and go about your business because it's going to get moist. And now you're going to get caked cornstarch, which is a perfect Petri dish for growing more fungus. So you definitely want to, uh, if you're going to use something like cornstarch, put it on your feet and use that to absorb the moisture and then let them dry out in open air or in the sun before you put your shoes back on. Okay, enough of that. Stings. What kind of stings are out there? Well, um, obviously we're concerned with bees, hornets, yellow jackets, wasp, and fire ants. And depending on where you are in the country and the world, these might be um, more prevalent. I've dealt with a lot of fire ant and a lot of fire ant injuries because I used to work in Central America uh, and there were huge amounts of fire ants there. And I would bring American teams out there uh, to do some exploration and education. Uh, and they weren't used to fire ants, so they weren't watching out for them. So often they'd just be sort of standing in a spot. The fire ants crawl up your leg pretty soon. There's a hundred or so on your leg. And then you start knocking them off and they send out a signal and all at once they sting you. So fire ants don't sting one at a time. They have a coordinated attack and suddenly it's like your legs on fire and it can be extremely painful. Uh, so you want to be able to deal with that. More common here, of course, is a single steam sting, sting or maybe a coordinated sting from a few hornets, um, something like that. Here are your priorities. First off, you want to get the stinger out of there. The stinger is still going to have some venom in it. So if you don't remove it, you're going to kind of keep getting stung for the next 15 minutes, potentially. The way to remove a stinger is not to take tweezers and just pull the stinger out because then you're squeezing the stinger and therefore squeezing the venom back into your body. You don't want to do that. So take the edge of a knife, a credit card, a piece of paper, whatever, get underneath the stinger. There you can see a picture beneath me, underneath the stinger and kind of scrape it off. That way you're not squeezing it and envenomating yourself even more. Uh, once you've done that, realize that if you haven't been stung by a bee recently, it doesn't last that long. So bee and hornet stings are gonna hurt for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then it's gonna be over. And if you don't have a serious anaphylactic reaction, that's pretty much going to be it for you. Um, and if you want to ease the pain a little bit, again, you could put an ointment on it. Triple antibiotic ointment is always a good safe call. Um, and a cold compress, again, can really help uh, quite a bit. Um, if you're worried about a poisonous effect or, or a toxic effect, 
realize that you're going to need a couple of hundred stings or maybe at least a hundred stings um, in order to get any kind of serious uh, metabolistic effect uh, from stings. So if you are attacked by massive killer bees, then maybe you have a concern. If your body was a third covered by fire ants, or and this happens, by the way, people fall asleep and fire ants come and cover them, and then they wake up, they freak out, and all the fire ants sting at once. Then you've got a potential for a real metabolistic, that is body-wide toxic effect. But otherwise, it's unlikely that you're going to have a very serious effect. So you really just need to deal with the temporary pain of the sting. You want to clean the spot, however, because bee stings and hornet stings and others can get infected, and uh, that's not super pleasant. And the infection will last longer than the sting actually will. So even then, if you've got a bee sting, um, you can take an antiseptic wipe, you could take a little soap and water, which is always good, and just wash the site out after you've removed the stinger. There's some other options out there. If you got stung and you really don't like the pain or you're concerned that you're going to have a bad reaction, one possibility, if you're very quick, is a suction device. So one suction device that's out there is called the extractor, and it looks like this. And basically, it's got a plunger. You can put it on the site of your bite. There we go. Ah. Okay, didn't work that way. Let me try it this way. Put on the site of your bite. And you see how it hangs there? Basically, it's created some suction and it's pulling. And they've got little fittings here. There's a fitting that'll go on. And you can pick the fitting that's going to go over your bite. Again, put it on, maybe moisten the edges a little bit. However, you got to do that in a wilderness situation. Put the plunger down. And now you get a pretty good suction there where it's really pulling out. Does this work? Eh. The manufacturers used to make a big deal out of this. And honestly, when I was first trained uh, as an EMT, uh, these were in all our kits. And we were instructed that if you had a snake bite, you would cut the bite open and then apply suction in this way. If you had a bee bite, you would immediately apply suction. Turns out it's really not that effective unless you get it on there right away. Basically, within a few minutes of a bite, from the venom is now absorbed into the tissue and no amount of suction is really going to do any good. And because these create suction, they can also create localized trauma. So they can actually increase the possibility of infection, which is pretty significant. So do you want one of these devices? Probably not. But if you insist and you have one of these devices, realize that they're really only effective within the first couple of minutes. So if you've got a bee sting, a few bee stings, and you've got one of these things, you can apply suction within that first minute. You might get half the venom out and that might remove the pain and it might reduce the overall effect if you're concerned that you're gonna have an allergic reaction to the bee sting. However, in most scenarios, it's really not worth it. And the possibility of creating trauma and potentially greater infection at the site really doesn't make it worth it. So uh, I have one because I have had one. Woo, I have had one uh, for whatever, 30 years. Um, I don't even keep this in my kit. So to be clear, I've got here, I'll show you. <laughs> here is my first aid kit. And as you can see, <laughs> it's pretty good size. But with all of that stuff, I don't even bother putting this in there. So I don't really need it around. Uh, anyways, it's there and you should be aware of it just in case somebody tries to sell you on one. Do you want to create suction any other way? No, not really. Not really. Not unless you're really worried worried. It's possible that somebody could have hypersensitivity. So, you know, one in a hundred people or so is going to, are going to have a more significant reaction uh, to a bee sting uh, or other insect sting. If that's the case, you may want to constrict venous return a little bit. Remember when we talked about the circulatory system, we talked about how um, arteries bring blood out to the extremities and the veins bring blood back toward the heart through the vena cava, right? Well, in this case, we're not going to put on a tourniquet. So remember, a tourniquet is like this, really significant. We are not putting that on. That is way too extreme, and it's going to cause more damage than it's worth. But we could take something like this, which is a sort of an elastic band, and we could put that around our arm. Get that on. There we go. 
zip it up. And now what I've got is just a tightening of an elastic band, just enough to not constrict arterial flow. So my arm is still getting blood, but the blood is being slowed on the way back through the veins. And in that way, it gives me a little bit more time before the um, venom gets systemically absorbed. Um, if somebody has indications or believes that they are hypersensitive, that may be desirable. Um, and what you really want to do is get them out of that scenario into medical care as soon as possible, because it could take some significant effort to address the hypersensitivity. Somebody that has such a sensitivity may have an EpiPen, epinephrine. Epinephrine is adrenaline, and adrenaline can be used to reverse the effects of shock caused by a bee sting. That term is anaphylactic. Anaphylactic shock is the shock caused by a bee sting. So if you know the person, you may be aware that they have uh, a hypersensitivity to bee stings. If you just run across somebody in a wilderness situation, you may wanna look for jewelry. Uh, so they might have a bracelet that indicates that they are prone to anaphylaxis. They may have a necklace that indicates that medical alert uh, necklace, something like that. And you may wanna check their gear um, for an epinephrine pen. An EpiPen looks like this. There it is. It generally has a needle that pokes out on one side. And on the other side, it's got a little safety plunger. So typically you have to pull out a little plunger like this. You would take this, put this into their thigh, press down. And you hear that click? Do it again. That click would be the needle, in this case, pumping into my arm uh, and providing the epinephrine. You hold it for about a three count. Uh, and that provides the epinephrine that will help them deal with anaphylactic shock. It, don't worry if you didn't get a full sense of this. We're going to use these actually in the CPR first aid class the first time we meet. So that will give you a better sense of how to do that. Uh, and the Red Cross manual and online materials will also give you a better sense of how to do that. So you may, if you've got somebody who got stung by a bee and then seems to be having a really serious reaction, they may have been aware of that sensitivity ahead of time. Uh, if you can't ask them uh, because they're unable to respond, you might look through their gear and see if they've got an EpiPen. If they do, you can assist them with the administration of epinephrine. If somebody else in your crew has epinephrine, you can't give it to them. If you have an EpiPen, you can't give them your EpiPen. This is a prescription-only only medication. You put yourself in jeopardy if you are giving them a prescription-only medication that is not prescribed for them. So we will talk about that when we get together uh, in person, but you wanna make sure that it's their prescription, that it's appropriate. In addition to that, that they are indeed having an anaphylactic reaction. And I'll talk in a second about that. But before I do, I wanna point out that the other reason you wanna check for jewelry is that they're gonna swell up. So if you've got somebody that got stung by a bee and now they seem to be having a pretty serious response, one of your first priorities is to get all the rings off of their fingers and any other constraining jewelry off of them because their fingers are gonna swell up and that could actually constrict blood flow significantly through a finger. You could even get lose a finger as a result of what is temporary swelling because you had a ring on there and that prohibited proper perfusion uh, to the fingertip for too long and caused uh, damage. So somebody is stung by a bee and they're having a more significant reaction than is normal. It's possible that they're having, they are entering anaphylactic shock. That's what we're concerned with. It's a form of shock. We're gonna take a uh, look, uh, see if there's any medical jewelry that would confirm our suspicion of anaphylaxis. Uh, we're gonna take off any rings or anything like that. We're gonna try to keep them calm as possible. Now. Oops. Anaphylaxis is a form of shock that is potentially fatal. Remember what shock is. We talked about this when we talked about circulation. The vessels expand, and so now you don't have enough fluid, enough blood to allow adequate perfusion throughout the body. Basically, you've got a dilation of your vessels, of your blood vessels. That means relatively you've got less an inadequate amount of fluid to keep the blood going to your fingers and toes and brain. That can be a real problem. The symptoms may occur five minutes after a sting. They may occur as long as an hour or even a little bit more after a sting. 
So you want to watch somebody who's been stung. If somebody gets stung by a bee, uh, you may want to kind of keep them with the group and keep an eye on them for at least an hour to make sure they don't have a bad reaction. Also realize that this, the epinephrine, only buys you time. The half-life of epinephrine is much shorter than the half-life of the venom in the bee. So you give them epinephrine, they're feeling better, and they think, oh my gosh, thank you so much. You saved my life. All right, let's keep hiking. No, you got to get them out of that scenario as soon as possible because the epinephrine is going to wear off after about 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. The bee sting effect won't. So they will go back into anaphylactic shock. So basically, you're just buying time with that EpiPen to get them to the hospital. That's all you're doing. You're not solving the problem. You are postponing the problem long enough to get them to medical care. The other thing you could consider is once you've stabilized the person, once you've given them ep epinephrine uh, or they are starting to recover, you may want to consider an oral antihistamine uh, that would allow them um, uh, to, to kind of increase their recovery a little better. What's happening with anaphylaxis is a few things. You're getting that um, dilation of the blood vessels. That means you're getting inadequate perfusion. That is the nature of shock, and that can get very, very serious very quickly. So you're going to get signs of inadequate perfusion, like, for example, pale, cool, clammy skin in the extremities, um, maybe lightheadedness, altered consciousness, stuff like that. In the case of anaphylaxis, you're also going to have trouble breathing because you'll remember we talked about this before. You've got um, those tubes heading down into your lungs that are swelling up. And as they do, as, they, as the bronchi swell up like that, they also allow fluid to build up into mucus. So now you've got narrower passages for airflow filled with mucus. So the person's gonna be <clears throat> having trouble breathing and wheezing. <clears throat> and that's not a good wheeze, hold on. <clears throat> I can't fake a wheeze. Wheezing, uh, especially as they exhale. You wanna look for things like that. Another possibility is skin hives, uh, which is very likely with anaphylaxis due to a bee sting. Now, why do you want to look for this kind of stuff? Because you want to make sure before you give an EpiPen that it's anaphylaxis. Realize if somebody believes they are prone to anaphylaxis and then they get stung by a bee, they're going to freak out. Their heart rate's going to increase. They're going to have trouble breathing. What they're having is a panic attack. And we don't give epinephrine for a panic attack. So the goal then would be to calm them down. So you got somebody that's stung by a bee. They're having trouble breathing. Their heart is racing. And you're thinking, it's anaphylaxis. And they're like, I have anaphylaxis. This is terrible. I'm having an attack. Give me an EpiPen. Give me an EpiPen. First thing you want to do is not inject them with epi epinephrine. You want to look at them and say, okay, wait a minute. Are they wheezing? Is their skin turning red? Do they have hives? Because if their only symptom is that they are breathing fast and their heart is pumping, it's probably just a panic attack brought on by a bee sting and their belief that they have that they have anaphylaxis. So if I can calm them down, they don't need that epinephrine. The other effect uh, that is really telling is you're going to get swelling, especially around the lips, the tongue, uh, maybe hands and feet, etc. So once you get those confirming symptoms, now you know that it's anaphylaxis, which means if you're in a wilderness scenario, you've got to evacuate them as quickly as possible. Uh, if you they've got epinephrine, you want to distribute that epinephrine as readily as possible and then realize that you're still in a hurry to get them out of there. Another possible vector of irritation is ticks. In fact, not possible, probable, likely, very highly likely. If you live in New Jersey and you go outside, you're going to get ticks. Uh, I probably pull 15 off of them uh, off of me a week and another 60 off of my dogs. So ticks are very, very common in New Jersey. Uh, they're basically spread um, not so much by deer, even though some of them are caused called deer ticks, um, but by uh, rodents. So as um, rodent populations get higher, you get higher ticks. And those uh, ticks carry things like Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and about half a dozen or more other diseases as well. So it's not just Lyme and things like that you have to worry about. There's all kinds of possibilities, which is why often people say, 
if you can recognize the kind of tick, so below me, you can see there, I've got deer tick and lone star ticks. There's also dog ticks and other ticks, but um, those are the more significant ticks that you're going to see. And uh, lone star ticks are certainly more likely to be bringing Rocky Mountain spotted fever and deer ticks are the most likely to be carrying Lyme disease, but there's tons of other diseases out there. So really the kind of tick doesn't matter all that much. Um, if you've got ticks on you, what you want to do is just pull them off. So basically you want to get in the habit of first tick proofing yourself before you go out into the wild. So maybe, you know, uh, putting an elastic around your leg, pant legs so that ticks can't get in there. Maybe making sure that your shirt's tucked in so that you can't, the ticks can't get around the waist. That's another very common spot. And then most importantly, when you're done outside at the end of the day, check yourself, check your partner, check your loved ones, check your dogs, check everybody for ticks and then remove them. And if you remove them within a few hours, it's really not a problem. It takes at least 24 hours for most illnesses and especially Lyme disease to be transmitted versus, uh, through a tick bite. So if you've got a tick on you and you pulled it off, that's not even a problem. If you got a tick on you and it's embedded and it may be a little bit of red welt and you pull it off within a day, also not a problem. If you have a tick on you and it's embedded and it created a welt and it's been on for over a day or you don't know how long it's been on, now you've got a little bit of a concern. And in that case, one thing you could do is talk to your physician about a single dose of doxycycline. Doxycycline uh, is an antibiotic. If you had Lyme disease, the first treatment would be doxycycline and you would take it for, I think, uh, 10 or 14 days. But there's clear evidence that a dose immediately, like within a day or two of having that tick bite, will knock the probability of getting Lyme, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, fever, and other tick-borne diseases by over 90%. So if you do fail to check yourself at the end of the day, and the next day you find that you got a tick, and there's a big old red welt, uh, and... Um, you know, the tick is a little bit engorged, so it looks like it's been there for a while. You pull that tick out, and then you contact your doctor and see if you can get a prescription for a single dose of doxycycline to take that day, and that will significantly reduce the probability of tick-borne illnesses. The way to pull out a tick is carefully. And also, as we did with the bee stinger, see if you can get a credit card or something underneath it and pull it out without squeezing it. If you squeeze the tick, then it's going to regurgitate back in before it gets all the way pulled out. Or worse, you're only going to pull out half of the tick. So don't just grab it and pull it out. Scrape it or, I don't know, dig it out, I guess, however you want to think about it, um, so that you're getting the whole tick out and without causing that tick to regurgitate back into you and possibly increasing the probability of a tick-borne illness uh, being transmitted. Watch the site. And if you get a bullseye pattern, that is to say a little redness and then no redness and then a bigger redness around it, that's a pretty clear indication that you have contracted Lyme disease. You want to see a physician as soon as possible because chronic Lyme disease can be really significant and really debilitating. Uh, I have Lyme disease and it pops back up in my life about every, I don't know, 18 months to three years where suddenly I'm not even, you know, not even suddenly, slowly I start feeling more and more fatigued, uh, more tired, um, et cetera. And then I suddenly realize, oh, this is the Lyme cropping back up and I got to go to the doctor and get some uh, doxycycline to knock it back down. So that's a problem you don't really want to deal with. Best thing to do is just check yourself for ticks. Be careful for ticks. Ticks don't fly, so don't worry about it. If you're walking through grass, uh, you're not going to get too many ticks on you. Rather, it's when you're pushing through brush, when the, the, the brush is pushing up against your legs, your hip area, or higher, then the ticks will jump from you. And they tend to come in clusters. So basically, there'll be like a dozen or more of them on a bush. You'll walk by it, and suddenly you'll have a dozen on you. So if you found one, look for more. Okay, two kinds of toxins that are out there that we kind of want to wrap our heads around. One is a hemotoxin, hemo meaning blood, 
And the other is a neurotoxin, neuro meaning neurological system. So hemotoxin uh, destroys red blood cells. It can be really problematic because it also disrupts the blood clotting mechanisms in your blood. So you can think of this as thinning your blood. It's not really thinning your blood, but it's interfering with clotting. Uh, and that can create real problems in your circulatory system and generalized tissue damage. Neurotoxins um, are a little bit different. They destroy parts of your nervous system, in particular, the uh, cells that transmit signals in your nervous system are deteriorated, uh, and that creates sort of a systemic problem as well. So when we talk about spiders and snakes, we are going to talk about neuro and hemotoxins, but realize that there's kind of a big overlap there, not in terms of toxins, but in terms of effects, so that uh, there are the effects that typically come from neurotoxins and others that typically come from hemotoxins, but often they're kind of entwined and ambiguous. So, you know, don't get too fixated on the hemo versus neuro, but it'll allow you to understand some of these. So black widows, for example, uh, provide neurotoxin venom. These are black widows. They are distinguished by that red hourglass shape in on their belly. But it's unlikely that you are going to grab a black widow and look at its belly. So it may just look like a black spider to you, or far more likely, it just may feel like a bite and you don't know what you were bit by. The bite itself is going to be a couple of small pinpricks. Black widow spites are not that painful at the beginning. So you might be working at the farm on campus. You might be I don't know where in the wood pile you might be hiking and you get you reach around a log without looking and suddenly you feel a little bite ah, and you pull back and maybe there's a couple little red dots and that's it pinprick not a big deal within an hour that might get significantly more painful within another half an hour you might start getting really anxious ill-focused maybe confused maybe nauseous, maybe you'll start throwing up, maybe you'll feel really weak. If you're healthy and fit and lucky, those symptoms will go away within about seven hours or so. That doesn't mean you shouldn't seek medical assistance because maybe they won't go away within seven hours. So the safe side is to go ahead and seek medical assistance. If it's painful at the site, try to relax. If you're helping another person, keep them calm. Again, provide ice, cooling to the area, can ease the pain, that's really good. Brown recluse is another spider that's out there. Its telltale sign is that violin on its back. Can you see, especially in the picture under me uh, with the quarter, how you've got, here, let me see if I can show you right here. You've got like a violin shape there. You can kind of see it too. But notice here, it's kind of hard to see. There it is right there, but it's kind of hard to see. And again, does it really matter if you get bit by a spider? Are you going to be like, well, I want to identify that spider? You probably ought to just watch for symptoms and then respond accordingly. In the case of a brown recluse spider, spider bite, uh, you may not even feel the bite. The redness might pop up after an hour or two hours and you may, didn't even know that you were bit before that. Here's the thing. This is a hemotoxin other than, rather than a neurotoxin. So black widow affects your entire system, makes you weak, makes you vomit, et cetera. To some, brown recluse, more or less, affects a localized area much more significantly. Doesn't mean you can't have generalized symptoms like vomiting, you certainly can, um, joint pain is fairly common. A fever can be very common. So you're going to have systematic uh, response. Those aren't going to be, in general, your biggest problem. The biggest problem is going to be the localized effect. What happens is that hemotoxin creates localized necrosis. Necrosis means death of tissue. So the tissue around the bite site starts dying and turns to black, dead tissue. Talk about that in a second. What should you do if you get such a bite? Well, once you realize that you've been bitten, again, one of the things you can do is apply ice to the area. You can take ibuprofen, that'll help reduce some of the pain, and it's perfectly safe if you've had a spider bite. Um, some of the symptoms that indicate a more systematic and problematic uh, response would be um, blood in your urine, 
um, or uh, paleness, especially or in your extremities first. So if you if somebody starts getting white, that's a bad sign. And in all these cases, for a brown recluse, if you are getting systematic, medical care is absolutely needed. Absolutely needed. Otherwise, you face this. This is the localized necrosis I was talking about. There is no solution for that. Um, at times, what happens is uh, physicians will cut the affected tissue out. At other times, you let it run its course and it creates a big old damaged area like that. Um, the one that's beneath me is about two hours after a bite. Um, the other one is a couple of weeks after a bite. Realize that full recovery of the bite site might take a couple of years. So you want to avoid brown recluse. And if you do get bit by a brown recluse, you want to absolutely seek medical care uh, as soon as you can. The thing is, neither of these spiders are particularly aggressive. So really, they are only biting you when they feel like they have been attacked or are at risk. So the thing you really want to do is avoid threatening them. Um, and you can avoid spider bites, or we could reduce spider bites by at least 90% in this country if hikers and outdoors folks were just a little bit more careful. So before you put on your clothes in the morning, shake them out. Before you put on that t-shirt out of your backpack, just shake it out. Make sure there's no spiders in it. If you're using an outhouse on out the back country, or if you're climbing through wooded areas or whatever, look at where you're putting your hands. Uh, in terms of an outhouse, that's a really common place to have spiders. Wood piles are also common places. Old debris from old buildings, very common places. So if you're poking around stuff like that, you want to be super careful for these spiders because both of them will ruin your day at least, uh, and both of them can be fatal. Another possibility that's out there is snakes. Pit vipers are probably the ones you're most likely to run across. Uh, and in particular, a variation on the rattlesnake is gonna be the one that you're most likely to run across. And you can see rattlesnakes here. They have different colorations, so don't be fooled by the coloration. This is a fairly typical pattern for a rattlesnake. But if you're up in the um, uh, Catskills, you could easily see rattlesnakes that just look completely black completely black snake. They will nevertheless have some distinguishing features. Most notably is the sl slitted eyes um, and the uh, triangle shaped head. So here's some imagery for you. On the left, there are the venomous snakes, that triangle shaped head, the pit, which is a sensor located uh, here um, is also a uh, distinguishing feature, but uh, you're not going to probably be able to see that in the snake. But the head shape, you'll certainly see. If it's a rattlesnake, you may hear that rattle. It's going to use that rattle as a warning. So if you're walking along and you hear the rattle, the appropriate thing to do is stop moving, not run away, stop moving. The snake is feeling threatened. If you stop moving, it's trying to warn you that it's feeling threatened. It's likely to not bite you. And then you can either very slowly walk away or allow it to move away because it's probably going to move away pretty quickly. So just freeze in place, move back if you can. I've run across rattlesnakes dozens of times out in the backcountry. I have yet to be bitten. I've only treated a few rattlesnake bites. Um, so uh, it's not all that common, but you do want to absolutely be careful. To be clear, rattlesnakes provide a hemotoxin, so a blood-borne toxin. However, envenomation is not at all certain, even if you were bit by a snake. The snake uses its venom to hunt, so it's not inclined to use its venom to kill you because it can't eat you. So that's a waste of venom, and it will have to spend energy building up more venom before it can eat. So it's possible that when it bites you, it's just a warning bite, and it has no venom in it at all, or a relatively modest amount of venomation. But full envenomation from a snake bite is not at all certain. If you get bit by a rattlesnake, you don't want to use compression. It's a hemotoxin. It's circulating through your blood. Um, compression is not going to help you there. You can get nausea, sweating, weakness, chills, fever, uh, thrombosis, which I'll talk about in a second, blurred vision, and tremors can all follow. Thrombosis uh, is blood clotting, and that's the thing that could actually kill you. So a thrombus is a clot of blood uh, in your circulatory system, um, and that is what makes this potentially 
the most deadly. So if you get any of these symptoms, or even if you don't, if you've gotten bitten by what you believe to be a pit viper, you absolutely want to seek medical care. Uh, you don't want to ignore it. You don't want to assume that it was a there was no venom just because you're not feeling sick half an hour after you were bit. The treatment, you could consider that suction device. The one I showed you before, they marketed it as being good for snake bites. Um, I would say I would only do that if you can get to that bite within a minute. So if you get bit by a snake and you have your suction device uh, handy in your backpack and you can pop it out and in a minute apply it to the side of the bite and suction out, sure, who knows? You might get 20%, 30% or more of the venom out, which could reduce it from a really serious envenomation to a modest envenomation. However, if it's been more than a few minutes, certainly if it's been more than 15 minutes, you don't want to bother with that. So if you are out hiking and run across somebody else and they were bit by a snake, you don't want to bother with that suction device. It's going to create trauma at the bite site and it's too late to draw any of the venom out. You do want to clean the wound because you get the possibility of infection in the wound. Generally, you don't want to apply a tourniquet even though plenty of movies will show you applying a tourniquet. However, if it's gonna take a while to get to medical care, you could consider a band like this. And it doesn't have to be a specifically made band like this. It could just be like a piece of stretchy elastic that you could wrap around your arm, oops, wrap around your arm and create just, there we go, makeshift constriction of blood flow just to slow the venous return to give you a little more time. If you're going to get to medical help within a couple hours, you should not do that. However, if you're out hiking and it's going to be a day or more before you get to medical help, even if you hurry along, then a constriction, not a tourniquet, tourniquets stop arterial flow. Constriction only stops venous return. So constriction may slow uh, the um, expansion of the envenomation. Uh, you do not want to apply ice directly to the bite. You may apply some cooling, like a wet cloth to uh, the bite, if you like, to take care of some of the localized pain. But it's likely that localized pain is not going to be your major problem with a rattlesnake bite. You don't need to know the type of pit viper. So again, something you'll see on TV and on movies is that people absolutely need to know the type of uh, snake. As long as you know it's a pit viper, you're fine. Um, because the um, treatment in the hospital for all pit vipers is the same. Now, if you want to confirm it's a pit viper, uh, the story out there, and you'll see this in some first aid manuals, is you got to capture the snake. You don't have to capture the snake. If the snake didn't inject venom in the first bite, they may decide to infect, infect you the sec with the second bite or envenomate you with the second bite. So don't go harassing the snake, but rather pull out your phone and take a picture of the snake so that somebody at the hospital can confirm uh, that it's a rattlesnake, and that way they're applying the proper antivenom uh, for the case. But the antivenom for all ra rattlesnakes, all pit fibers in North America is the same. If you're unsure of the snake, now, here's the thing. In North America, the most common kind of venom snake uh, is the pit viper, the rattlesnake. However, people also have pet snakes, and sometimes those pet snakes get out. So if you saw a snake and you can't be sure that it's a rattlesnake, uh, you definitely want to take a picture of it. If you have to kill it, um, then go ahead and do that and bring it to the hospital. Bring it in a hard container and realize you can still get bit by a dead snake. What I mean by that is it's still got a head with fangs exposed. Um, and it has happened before where people have dead snakes on the ground and then somebody steps on them or otherwise gets scraped by those fangs and gets envenomated by a dead snake. So you want to be super careful because what you got is a couple of sharp fangs there that have venom coming out of them. Okay. Uh, one other thing you can do is a little trick to help the physicians uh, in their diagnosis and in determining what treatment is necessary is you can mark the perimeters. So if you've got a snake bite here and it's just red around here, go ahead and mark that spot with a Sharpie and then write a time on it. And then later, if it's out to here, mark that spot and write a time on that line. And that way, by the time you get to the hospital, there's two or three circles there and the physicians get a really clear sense of how quickly uh, the damage is spreading. When do you get fatal snake bites? Well, the symptoms begin the same, weakness, vomiting, sweating, numbness, tingling around the mouth. 
You get a metallic taste in your mouth if it's a rattlesnake. Um, you might have, again, muscle twitching happening. But the real thing that happens is two. One is shock. So you're getting hypotension. Hypo means low. Tension means blood pressure. So you're getting low blood pressure, which means poor perfusion, which is a type of toxic shock. So now you're getting poor blood flow to parts of your body or necessary organs and extremities. That's a real problem. In addition, the hemotoxin disrupts your coagulation. So it disrupts your um, body's capacity to coagulate um, and increases membrane permeability. So fluid is able to kind of flow through tissue much more easily. The dilemma with that is that your lungs, remember how your lungs function? Blood circulates right next to the membranes of your lungs. So air's on one side, blood's on the other. If that membrane becomes permeable, then the blood's fluid flows into the alveoli and fills the alveoli with fluid. But you know that the alveoli's job is to exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen with the blood. It can't do that now because it's filled with fluid. So you literally can't breathe because your alveoli are filled with fluid as a result of the effects of the snake bite. So when do you start seeing really deadly effects from the snake bite? When you see those systemic effects, when you see indications of inadequate perfusion, when you see difficulty breathing, especially fluid indications of fluid buildup in the lungs, um, which is an indication of pulmonary edema. That's fluid buildup, that's the edema. Pulmonary means in your lungs. Again, we've talked about this before, shock, shock, shock. These are all variations on perfusion um, and shock, right? So you want to be looking for those effects because when you start getting those effects, that means you're in a hurry. You need to get that person to care very, very quickly. That's the rattlesnake. Another snake that's out there is the coral snake. And you've probably run across mnemonics for this, you know, red and yellow, your lucky fellow, red and black, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. Here's the thing. If it looks like a coral snake, assume it's a coral snake because the colors change in different regions and the colors around the world change as well. So it's not helpful to learn a mnemonic. It's helpful to know that a coral snake generally looks like that. It's multicolored. And in nature, by the way, things that are multi bright colors usually are problematic because those bright colors give it an advantage against possible predators. They identify it as poisonous. And so the predators know to avoid that snake because that snake could kill them. So being bright colored is helpful only if you're super dangerous because people know to keep away from you because you're super dangerous. Therefore, when something's bright colored like that, whether it's berries or whatever, that can be a problem. But in this case, if it looks like a coral snake like this, let's just say it's a coral snake. Coral snake is kind of interesting. It's a neurotoxin. It can cause paralysis within a couple of hours. A bite causes paralysis. Paralysis is inability to move certain body parts or maybe generalized paralysis for many of your body parts. Uh, the victim may experience or exhibit really bizarre, bizarre behavior. It affects your capacity for menstruation, uh, mentation, excuse me, mentation capacity to think. Uh, so you may um, have difficulty um, sort of um, thinking. You may start acting a little weird. The victim might start saying bizarre stuff, um, acting with a great deal of energy or saying stuff that doesn't make any sense. That gives you a sense that it's serious and you need to get them to care pretty quickly. And realize there may be no symptoms at the bite site. So you may not even fully realize that the person was bit by a coral snake. But if you start seeing these symptoms, you have to start looking for a coral snake bite. Coral snakes don't actually envenomate with their fangs. They do sort of chewing kind of thing. So it's a little bit harder to get uh, envenomated with a coral snake because it takes a little longer. So a quick snap by a coral snake is unlikely. It's mostly a warning. It's unlikely to cause carry significant envenomation. Uh, it's got to be more of a significant bite uh, to create that kind of an effect. In this case, what do you want to do? Well, you probably have uh, somewhere an indication that you've got a bite, so you want to clean that bite. Uh, if you can apply suction immediately, go ahead, but if it's going to take more than a minute or two, it's not worth the bother. In this case, very different than a pit viper like a rattlesnake, you want to wrap the area as tightly as you would a sprained ankle. So you want to take an elastic bandage or gauze and wrap it super tight. 
basically you're trying to stop the expansion uh, and absorption of that neurotoxin uh, into the tissue. And you want to wrap for quite a bit. So if they're bit in the leg, lower leg, you want to wrap at least up to the knee or higher. If you can wrap the entire leg, that's a good thing to do. Uh, if you're bit in the hand, you want to wrap at least up to the elbow. Try to stop the localized absorption of that venom. You would also potentially want to apply the same kind of constricting bands we've talked about before, but in this case, it's even more important to put that constricting band in place. And then uh, you want to make sure that you've identified the snake. If you can, do not delay care in order to identify the snake, but if it's not going to delay getting that person to care and you can provide the snake or a picture of the snake, that'll be super helpful when you get to the hospital because unlike rattlesnakes, depending on the type of snake, it may change the antivenom protocol. There's other dangerous snakes that are out there as well. Copperheads are one, cottonmouths are another. Bites from these two snakes are, are rarely serious. Uh, they can be painful, they can create systemic response, but it generally goes away on its own and it's not problematic. That is not to say that you don't need medical care, but rather you would treat bites from either of these two snakes uh, with supportive care, just as you've done with bikes from other snakes. So a cool compress, uh, you don't need to worry about a constrictive band, uh, but you can certainly get them to medical care and certainly clean the site to reduce the possibility of infection. Um, cotton mouths generally are in uh, wet areas. Copperheads, in my experience, are more typically uh, in uh, built up or abandoned areas, abandoned houses, uh, rock areas, stuff like that. You can see cottonmouths actually swimming in swampy waters. Uh, but in both those cases, it's unlikely to be a serious bite. So to some degree, identifying the snake in this time matters because it'll allow you to know that the severity is not as great as it would be with a rattlesnake um, or with a coral snake, which is uh, really problematic. Are there other poisonous snakes out there? Yeah, but I can't cover in a first aid class all the snakes around the world. In North America, these are the snakes you're likely to run across unless somebody's pet snake got out. Um, however, if you go to South America or Africa or other areas, you're going to have a whole different possibility of um, poisonous snakes. So if you plan on doing any backcountry adventures in those areas, learn about the snakes before you go out there and make sure you know what the risks are and uh, how to behave and how to provide care. That's it for poisons and venoms. I'll uh, see you in the next video. Take care.